just open with this. Um, we have a huge amount of material to cover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give them notes. And, and if you haven't looked at it, you really should. Um, I, I'm definitely going to make it must reading for at least one, if not both, of the courses that I teach here. Um, let me just start with Director Mueller, who I didn't have the pleasure of serving under when I was in the FBI. But he, needless to say, the fact that President Obama chose to extend his term as FBI director, which is fixed at 10 years because of what he was doing, I think speaks for itself. Um, integrity, ability, and veracity when you speak about Mueller is not the issue here. Um, this report's a product of an incredibly talented team of investigators that did an incredible amount of work. I'll just set the stage for Malcolm. If you haven't looked at it, volume one talks about the Russia investigation itself. Um, it documents over 100 pages of contacts between individuals associated with the campaign and people on the Russian side. Volume two then looks at obstruction. And as Malcolm will tell you, um, I'm not an attorney, but if there's not obstruction in, in volume two, I don't know what it is. Uh -huh. So I'm going to pitch to you, Malcolm, to just let you start wherever you like. We've got about 400 pages of information here. Um, we've got, to, and for those of you who sent us questions over the weekend, we will get to some of those questions. And obviously, for those of you here today, we will certainly take questions from you. But Malcolm, start wherever you like. Okay. Well, first, thanks. Uh, I'm really happy to be back at USC again. Uh, and, and every time I come back, they hand me the same pin <laughs> to put on my lapel. So I've got like a collection of them now. And uh, usually I start off with a joke. Uh, but today I'm not going to start off with a joke because one, we have limited amount of time. I want to get to your questions and I want to try to impart some information that you can take away so that when you do sit down and read all 448 pages of part one of the Mueller report, you can understand some of the things. Um, I am writing the third book in the plot two or the plot of or Plot 4 Trilogy, however you want to put it. You know, I wrote Plot to Hack America six weeks, it was published six weeks before the election. And when I wrote that book, it was me doing a brain dump of what I clearly saw in just, in, in less than a couple of months, was a Russian intelligence operation that was using American social media and our own freedom of information and freedom of speech as a weapon against ourselves in order to split one political party into two so that another political party would win the presidency. And, uh, you know, I'm often asked that question, how did you come up with that so fast? Well, it wasn't so much as I came up with it fast as I just quickly identified the components of what a foreign intelligence operation would have to have in place in order to achieve the effects that I was seeing in the same news media that you were all reading. All of us were watching the election process. But before I wrote Plot to Hack America, I had just finished a book called Hacking ISIS. And this is where I sort of arc over from counter-terrorism counter and terrorism intelligence into what would become now a foreign counterintelligence operation in the United States that was used to essentially break our democracy. So I'm always asked by journalists, hey, well, you know, how did you do this? How, you know, how, how, what was your analytical process? Well, the first one was very easy. Um, I'm not a journalist, right? I'm not a reporter, even though it looks like I play one on TV. <laughs> In fact, I'm an analyst, and my job is to sort of just give you the play-by-play -play and another realm of experience to explain the things that you see me talk about on television. And I guess I, I guess I turned out okay with that, because my job is to make you smarter, right? You're still going to have to do the work, right? We're, we're at a university here. You're going to have to do the, the school work, right, to understand really what's going on. But when I come onto media, my sole function is to try to help you to understand complex political and intelligence related or geopolitical issues so that this no longer becomes a giant mystery. It's boring, okay? I know, I wrote two books that were essentially the Mueller report. Um, 
again, when I started with Plot to Hack America, it, it, it stemmed from this book that I had finished called Hacking ISIS. Mm -hmm. And while I was writing this book, Hacking ISIS, I discovered the, you know, that there were two events that occurred a few years before the Democratic National Committee hack. One was the hacking of the Warsaw, the Polish stock exchange. And when the vandals went and hacked in and broke into the stock exchange website, they left symbology of ISIS all around, right, the Islamic State. Now, we knew that their hackers weren't that good. I mean, it's the stock exchange. Then a few months later, TV5 Paris was hacked. TV Sank, TV Sank Monde was hacked in Paris. And the same thing happened. They left all this vandalism there that they were like ISIS, but they had gone through emails, they had gone through phone records. And the cybersecurity groups that had watched them do this had identified this through cyber fingerprints as belonging to a Russian military intelligence organization that we love to call Cozy Bear, right? That's not their name. Their real name is ATP-28, Advanced Persistent Threat 28. By the way, that is not the name of an actual group of people. That is the cyber weapon system or the cyber toolkit that they use to go in and break into things. But it's fun to think of a group of guys all sitting around with like fancy bear and cozy bear coffee mugs, right? <laughs> Which I will eventually be selling on my website. Because <laughs> that's just such a good idea. <laughs> so that being said, as soon as I had learned that, I said, well, we have Russian military intelligence. They had, this cyber group had also attempted to do phishing operations, spear phishing operations against members of the White House. They had done it against the Pentagon. And for the previous five years, they had been carrying out operations all around the world. So when I heard in late April that the Democratic National Committee had been hacked, the first thing that I thought of was, wait a minute, why would you hack the Democratic National Committee? And I said, the only thing you could ever want out of there is to recreate Watergate. And Watergate was a break-in where men physically went to the Watergate Hotel, broke in there, went into the offices of the DNC, went through all the files, planted bugs on the phone, and were collecting intelligence in order to help re-elect, or President Nixon had already been re-elected, but had, had to get advantage from the Democratic National Committee for the Republican Party. And I said, wait, 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 this is all wrong. If someone's hacked into the DNC, then they fully intend to do Watergate because there is nothing in that building you want. It's not for just credit card numbers. And then we learned that the group that had hacked into it was Cozy Bear. And then another cyber malware suite was used as well, which was ATP-29, Fancy Bear, which belonged to the Russian State Clandestine Service, the intelligence agency, the FSB, Russian's intelligence agency. And I said, okay, I have Russian military intelligence and I have Russian uh, state intelligence inside the service of the Democratic National Committee. The only thing they want is that they want all the information that's in there about Hillary Clinton and the opponent, Donald Trump. That's it. Because, now I know they wanted the information on Donald Trump because a month later, you guys remember the old online magazine called Gawker? Gawker News Media got broken up by Peter Thiel. Gawker, there's a writer there, a great guy named Sam Biddle. He somehow received the entire opposition research folder about Donald Trump. Miraculously showed up in his inbox that was stolen from the DNC. And there was a worker at the DMC named Alexandria Chalupa, and it was her job to compile this folder. It was hacked, taken, and delivered to Gawker. And if any of you remember the George Bush days, Karl Rove, George Bush's brain, his political warfare brain, used to say, or used to act, he'd get damaging information out early and first. And that's what happened. Somebody took everything the Democratic National Committee had found on Donald Trump, which was nothing, because it was all from, like, you know, the New York Daily News and the New York Post, you know, celebrity magazines, and had delivered it to a newspaper to get it out. And that was my first sign that this operation was designed to elect Donald Trump president. 
because there were 16 other Republicans they didn't do this on. Mm -hmm. There were Democrats that they didn't do it on. And these, whoever the people that did it, broke in to the Democratic Party. <laughs> Who wants to do that? Nobody wants to do that. You go do that, go steal credit cards. Which it turns out, these cyber warfare operators from Russia were living inside the servers of the DNC. And their job was to destroy the Democratic Party in the election and make sure that someone got elected who was not Hillary Clinton. That was my first thought. By early June, that would be validated. Uh, a character by the name of Guccifer 2.0 pops up on the internet and says, hey, y'all, I'm Guccifer 2.0 and I got all the DNC materials. And you're thinking, wait a minute, we had just arrested the real Guccifer, who was a Romanian hacker who had gone around, he had hacked Colin Powell's emails, he had attempted to get Hillary Clinton's emails. He's cooperating with the FBI. So someone is either, one, very lazy, okay, and they think we're stupid, or two, they're so bold that they think the news media will glom onto it because the name Guccifer's involved. And the second choice was mm -hmm. correct, right? The news media jumped right on it. Who are you? How can you be Guccifer? Guccifer's under arrest. I'm Guccifer 2.0 and I've got everything from the Democratic Party hackers. Blah, 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 blah. All sorts of signs gave us indications that this was not an act. First off, it's not an individual, because he was answering questions all day and night, right? And that's a sign that you have, as we say in the military, a watch section. A watch section is a group of people who do an eight-hour shift, and then the eve watch comes in, and they do an eight-hour shift, and then the mid-watch comes in, and they do an eight-hour shift, and your operations keep going round and round, right? So it became pretty quickly apparent, even to some journalists, that this was not a real entity. This guy claimed to be Romanian, People who were real experts could tell by the way he was typing and the letters he was using that he was using a Cyrillic keyboard, which is the language of Russia, right? And many other places who speak Russian language. Not Romanian, right? Which is a Romance language. Funny Romance language, but it's still Romance language, right? Dirty Italian, that's what I like to call it. <laughs> so, for anybody who's been to Romania. So, they realized quickly that this guy may not be who he said it is, but once it was in the media information stream, that's all it took. And at this point, I started r realizing there is something nefarious going on here. I've got ATP 28, ATP 29 has been in the Democratic National Committee uh, servers. Then I have this character, Gucci for 2.0, going up there. And the thing that really sealed it for me, which made me come on and come on to national television without really telling anybody what I was there to do, was when WikiLeaks had claimed that they had received all of the Democratic National Committee emails from Gucci for 2.0 and were about to broadcast them. We're going to start putting them out. And they started putting them out the weekend of 22, 23, 24 July the three days before the Democratic National Convention. And what happened the morning of the Democratic National Convention? That's when you had the Bernie Sanders riot. And you recall the emails all weekend were, the fix was in. Hillary Clinton and Debbie Wasserman Schultz had stealing the, 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 um, stealing the nomination from Bernie Sanders. Now, all of this sounds simplistic to us. But to me, that instant, that whole weekend, I was soliciting, trying to get on television to say, this isn't what you think it is. This is a warfare attack on the United States. This is a foreign entity has manipulated the media, manipulated or is using WikiLeaks as a laundromat, has gone into a national political party, and they have used this information so that the morning of the first day of the DNC, that they would split the Democratic Party into two. Hopefully, Bernie Sanders would run as an independent, and Donald Trump would be elected to the presidency. All of that went through my mind in about a 30-second span, because it's the little things we see uh, in, in this constellation of data, right? When the media sees it, when they see a, an information point, they spend a lot of time validating that information point. 
And what they'll say is, oh, that's a star, and that's another star, and here's some more stars. In my world, I see one star, I see another star, I see an alternate star, and my mind goes, Cassiopeia. Right? I have to, I have to immediately build that out onto the frame of something that exists or something that should exist, whatever it is in Arabic, or whatever it is in Farsi, or whatever it is in, in Chinese, because all those constellations have a different name. But I can tell a pattern when I see one. And I'm a child, even though I worked in the Middle East, I'm a specialist in Middle East terrorism, I grew up in the Cold War. I started my intelligence operations in the Cold War, and the KGB was everywhere in my world. And the one thing that I remember out of all of my studies, reading books and top secret classified manuals, having to go to counterintelligence briefings, having KGB people try to pick you up in men's bathrooms in Naples, <laughs> that actually happens. <laughs> because back in the old days, the Russians, the Soviets, flooded the zone with spies. And when they wanted to affect change, they never knew what was going to work. And so they tried everything simultaneously. And the one thing that they really relied on, what they were masters of, was disinformation. No kidding. Uh, but the problem with the Soviet Union was it was, in an, it was in an old world. I mean, the difference between how the Russians distributed their propaganda and the way that Gutenberg built the first Bible was almost precisely the same. Printing presses, people doing typeset, using maybe, if they were lucky, they got a selectric typewriter, and they would take these fake stories that they had developed by scholars, right? I mean, the Soviet Union used real scholarships. Their universities didn't do anything in the world other than produce people who thought for the Supreme Soviet or helped the intelligence community. And the one thing they were very good at was lying. We all remember the Russian newspaper from Moscow. Does everybody remember the name? Pravda. What did it mean when, we were, when, we, when the Soviet Union was around? It meant truth. The Pravda is the Russian word for truth. But we all meant it to mean what? A lie. Prav people would say that. Pravda means lie. The truth is a lie in the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed, all of those intelligence processes, all of that information, and all of those archives did not disappear. In fact, I was ridiculed by Russia Today, which is their, their new state-sponsored media organ. Mm -hmm. And they said, MSNBC terrorism expert Malcolm Nance <laughs> thinks Vladimir Putin was director of the KGB. They were right. He was not director of the KGB. He was director of the FSB. But here's a story that actually happened. So one day, when the Soviet Union collapses at number 10 Derezhinsky Square, the headquarters of the KGB, well, they weren't the KGB anymore. And when they transitioned, they transitioned to a new organization. So a guy comes from maintenance, and he brings a screwdriver, and he takes down the letters K and G. And he puts up the letters F and S. And that's how the KGB became the FSB. That's all that changed was their name and the fact that they got a ginormous multi-billion dollar budget. But nothing left the archives. None of their studies went away. All of their spies came to work on schedule. They started hiring newer, younger, faster kids who understood the world of computers. You have to remember, I, I just came back from Germany. And I had a great trip. I went to Berlin. And while I was there, I went to the city of Dresden, where I visited the office of Vladimir Putin when he was a KGB officer. And I went there with a scholar, a guy who was a scholar on KGB and Stasi organization. That's the East German secret police. And he lived in a lovely little villa. Well, he and his family actually lived in an apartment block. But he worked in a lovely villa. Do any of you know the, the composer Schumann? Right? His wife, Claire Schumann, lived up the street. Right? This is a, a 19th century beautiful neighborhood which was not burned down by the great firebombing in Dresden. So... 
But across the street, past this guest house, across the trolley tracks, was the KGB torture center that they had established in 1945 when they took the city. And it was turned over to the Stasi, and today it is a memorial museum for torture. But across the street is a beautiful neighborhood. And that's where Vladimir Putin worked. And I went into the building, and I learned a lot of things. One, they had a sauna in the basement. That was taken out. I missed that. <laughs> but they had microphones in every door frame of every door in that building. And when the German, I, I met one of the East German, or the woman who formerly East German, who took over the building for this philosophical society later, and she said it was just easier to take off all the door frames. There were hundreds and hundreds of feet of wires. They kept microphones so that every person in Putin's office would know they were constantly under surveillance. Mm -hmm. So, why am I telling you this story? What do you care about baby spy Putin? Because when Vladimir Putin was a baby spy in Russia, as a KGB officer, his sole function was to learn, to work with the East Germans, was to recruit people who were coming from the West, who may have had relatives in East Germany, who may have been curious West Germans who wanted to see the great, you know, the monuments in Dresden, which at that time were burned, still burned to the ground from World War II, who may have had a girlfriend in, West, in East Germany. Their job was to catch them, interrogate them, turn them into spies, and send them back to the West. Vladimir Putin, Putin was a human intelligence officer. His job was to turn people into traitors. And then, you know, maybe he can get something out of it too, right? Promotion, you know, maybe a, an old beater of a car, right? This is East Germany in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And then the Soviet Union collapsed. The entire belief system, when he was a teenager, I believe he was 12 or 13, he met, uh, he w there was a KGB open house at, at his city in St. Petersburg at the time called Leningrad, and he asked them, how do I become a KGB officer? They said, finish school, go to university, become a lawyer, come back, the organization will be there. Vladimir Putin, like me, wanted to be a spy from teen, his teen days. And he became a, a relatively okay one. There's very little we know about his records, but that's what he did. He was a person who collected human beings and turned those human beings into an information flow for a great evil empire. That evil empire collapsed, and he went back to St. Petersburg to be a car salesman or a taxi driver. That's what people say he said he was going to do. There's a biography where all the people who worked with him in Dresden talk about him. But then he went, he did something interesting, and that brings me to the Mueller report. Before he left East Germany, he went to the headquarters of the Stasi, the East German secret police, where they kept a combined folder of all the names of every person they had ever tried to recruit. And he took that binder with him. It had Americans, Germans, French, British, and hundreds and hundreds of West Germans and East Germans in that folder. And he took this classified folder with him. And he said that, he told one of his mates that what he would do is he would use that at some point. It would become valuable. But he probably just did what I do with all my old stuff. I keep it on a shelf. But it reminds me of what I could do. When he went back to St. Petersburg, he became an enforcer for the mayor of St. Petersburg. He was technically a deputy mayor. At that time, Russia was liquidating. They were selling everything. The fire hydrants did not belong to the city of St. Petersburg. They sold them. Fire trucks, airports, airplanes, the seaport, all of it was sold for pennies on the dollar. And his job was to use his former KGB contacts and whatever he could glom out of that book to bring people under the control of the mayor of St. Petersburg. And that's how he used the KGB to become a billionaire. Because the Russian mafia, they didn't fear anything. When you're a criminal in Russia, you don't care. You are a lifelong criminal class. But there is something they, were, they always feared, 
And that was that the KGB would disappear them into the night. So if you use that legend and use your friends, you could control the mafia. And that's what he did. By controlling the mafia, the mayor of St. Petersburg became very rich. And he became very rich. But he was a very loyal guy. And so when Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russia, was under the gun for corruption, he made Vladimir Putin the director of the FSB, which is really the KGB, right? Putin started blackmailing people that were investigating Putin, uh, Yeltsin for corruption. And suddenly the word compromise or compromising blackmailable material came into the lexicon. And he started with the, the guy who was the equivalent of the Attorney General of Russia. He had a video of him with two prostitutes, and he played it on national television, right? Ended all corruption investigations into Vla Boris Yeltsin in Russia. Boris Yeltsin was so happy, he made him the, de the deputy president or the assistant president of Russia, deputy prime minister of Russia. And then Yeltsin stepped down, and Vladimir Putin became the president of Russia. And then he turned it into a communist dictatorship without the communism. A capitalist dictatorship, which Benito Mussolini used to call fascism. A corporate dictatorship of the ultra-right. That is where Russia is today. But if you read the Mueller report, especially section one, you will find... First, I want to, I want to, before you get to it, you're all going to say, but what about collusion, Malcolm? Mm -hmm. On page two. Mm -hmm. It's tabbed for you right there. Thank you. I Little knew, tab. I, I knew you would go to that. Page two, it says, there is no legal term called collusion. Collusion is not a specific offense or theory of liability found in the United States Code, nor is it a term of art in federal criminal law. We address the factual question whether members of the Trump campaign coordinated. Like collusion, coordination does not have a settled definition in federal criminal law. We applied the term coordination in the sense that when stating in the report that an investigation did not establish the Trump campaign coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference in activities. And this is my favorite sentence of that. That requires more than the two parties taking actions that were informed by or responsive to other actions or interests. So the next time you rob a bank, okay, don't discuss it. Have one guy open the door and you come in with a gun and you just stand there. And when everybody hands the money to the other guy and you all walk out the door, you did not collude, you did not coordinate, and you did not conspire. Because, I will read it again, that requires more than the two parties taking actions that were informed by or responsive to other actions or interests. Now, I'm going to give you guys my opinion. Everybody's here to hear what I have to say about the Mueller report. <laughs> Section 1 is 448 pages of conspiracy and collusion. Mm -hmm. But it did not meet the legal standard that the special counsel established for criminal conspiracy. Everyone else in this room will have gone to prison. Right? But for the purposes of this investigation, they built in their own parameters. Now, why, Malcolm, did you give that long, ongoing discussion about Vladimir Putin, baby spy? Because this section catalogs all of the Russian contacts with the people in the Trump campaign. But more importantly, it shows that Russia, for some strange reason, in order to benefit one person, starting as far back as 2013, in my books it's earlier, right? They flooded the zone with every type of intelligence activity imaginable. It's all here. I mean, you know, somebody joked on Twitter, they should call this the Malcolm Report because I read this. <laughs> read it all and plot to hack America and plot to destroy democracy. No, there's more stuff in here. 
First off, we all know about the hackings. The hackings were the easy part. You use a military intelligence group, you break into servers, you take that information. All intelligence is information warfare. There is a reason you steal information from your opponents. Because you want to use it. Sometimes it's used in a benign fashion where you just know it, and they don't know you know it, and you keep doing your behaviors on a daily basis, and I drop a cruise missile on top of you. Because you don't know that I know that every Thursday at 7 o'clock, right, you go out and have, smoke a shisha at a certain bar in, you know, western Afghanistan. We kill people with intelligence, right? That'll earn you a Hellfire missile. That's what drones are for. But in the counterintelligence world, which this report involves, that's what we call, that's the technical term, for spy hunting. And I was one of the first people, and I was ridiculed. I was ridiculed just last week. It's all conspiracy theory. But I said this on national television I don't know how many times. This investigation started because we had suspicions that American citizens were working with a foreign intelligence agency and may have been trying to affect the fundamental system of our democracy, elections. Now, the investigation itself seemed to have, in my opinion, pulled a lot of punches. There were things in here that, you know, I, I talk to lawyers all the time. I have some of the greatest legal scholars in the United States sit in the green room with me and go, how is this not what it is? But what I'm not going to do here today is I'm not going to sit here and try to, you know, I was going to use a military term that involved blowing sunshine. <laughs> I am not going to try to convince you that there was no collusion in this report. Because collusion is a term that the president has chosen, right? But what is a fact in here, and what most of this report will tell you in high, great detail, is that there was a massive, ginormous, multi-year Russian intelligence operation to break the American system of democracy and to choose a president of the United States. So, Malcolm, with that, yes. let me just ask you this. If Putin's grand plan mm -hmm. was to disrupt American democracy, install Trump as president, wouldn't it have been simpler to attack our voting machine system? Yeah, that's a great or our question. our voting machines? It's a, it's a good question. Well, you know, I live in a, you know, I, I vote in upstate New York, mm -hmm. right? Um, we have these, like, really archaic, you know, I don't even know how to describe them. <laughs> they're, you gotta, they're like slot machines. Uh -huh. You've got to pull a handle, and it goes, zhish, zhish, and it pokes all the holes mm -hmm. in, your mach in your card, Okay. right? That's like ancient, you know? I, it's, it's from like the 30s. Um, that's the beauty of the American voting system. It's so wide mm -hmm. and diverse. The next county could be using electronic machines. Okay. And the next county over could be using filling out black cards in a, in a process reader. Mm -hmm. We're so screwed up <laughs> that there's no way. There is no way you can hack all of those machines. But what you can hack, and I said this in the run-up to the election, you can go to, you know, in the oldie days, they would have a chalkboard and a telephone bank. And they would receive phone calls from each county, and they would write down, Volusia County, 337 votes, right? Joe Blow County, 45, you know, 4,512 votes. And then they would do on the chalkboard, some of you might remember this, you youngins, it's called arithmetic. <laughs> and you had to do it by hand. Mm -hmm. And you had to show your work. And then you'd take a chalk and you'd put a line underneath it. And then you would just put your finger like this and then you'd start calculating and tabulating each individual column of numbers. And at the end, this thing called the sum or the total would come out. And it wasn't on your phone. You're dating us. So, no, there's kids in here. So, <laughs> gotta put it into the proper historical perspective. So, oh, I meant USC students. Okay. So, and they would tabulate, and, in, and I remember in the 70s, they would do it on television. Mm -hmm. Right? So you could do the math yourself. Right. You could go along. 
That was done with each individual precinct calling up to the counties. The counties would call that number up to the state. The state would put out a giant tabulation. Of course, with the modern age, that's now all done by computers. And those numbers can be emailed or they can be transmitted internally. And those numbers will all come to one computer, essentially, and will give you a final number. That's where you hack. Forget all the rest of those machines, man. So let me do this. Yeah. Let's, in the time we have, yeah. let's switch to volume two for obstruction for just a couple of moments. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, if you haven't seen... Hold on, I'll get Jill wine bags from my lifeline here. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you haven't seen Andrew McCabe's book, uh, The Threat, I mean... Good book. He certainly speaks to the reasons that he took notes, just like Comey. Yeah. Um, documented all of his conversations with the president, yeah. talks about all the things that happened after the president realized that, that there was an investigation going on in right. which he was the subject. So, I mean, if you look at, at some of the volume here, I mean, you could just almost pick any page, and you and I have discussed this. I mean, at any point in the second volume when you read it, you'll see that almost every page documents actions of obstruction. So... I want to ask you, there's, there's really two phases here where the president kind of shifts. In his first phase, um, his first interactions with Comey, the report says that the president's firing of Comey when he became aware of the special counsel being appointed, and then his own conduct was being investigated, he switches into a second phase where it involves public attacks on the investigation, non-public efforts to control it, efforts in both public and private to encourage witnesses not to cooperate. Why did Mueller spend all of this time talking about obstruction and never going to the threshold and saying it's happened? <laughs> you tell me, G-Man. <laughs> I mean, you're the FBI agent here. I was expecting Elliot Ness. How many of you were expecting Elliot Ness to come busting through the door, all right, mm -hmm. and start arresting some people, okay? I, I always use this analogy. Um, when Al Capone ordered the Saturday Night Massacre, right, or the uh, St. Valentine's Day Massacre, he was in Florida. Did you know that? No. No, he wasn't in Chicago. Huh. There was a garage full of dead bodies in <laughs> Chicago. Someone had walked in with Thompson submachine guns and had gunned down all of these people, but he was seen, he had witnesses, none of the evidence tied it to him, it was all there. But he ordered the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That's what history shows us. But Al Capone would be convicted and sent to prison on tax evasion, where he would die of syphilis that he contracted while in there. But that is how justice works. This report, for some people, was supposed to be the end-all, be-all. And I don't want to disappoint you. I, I, I do want to go back and touch on how they did flood the zone of this nation. Mm -hmm. they, I had a little chart here that I forgot, conveniently, because they said no PowerPoint. But it showed that the first thing that they did was they started a, a strategic framework around this election most people, the report says 2015, mm -hmm. and that the Internet Research Agency started in 2014. We have evidence from other hearings that show the Internet Research Agency hired its top managers two months before Miss Universe pageant in 2014. I don't know about you, but when I stand up a new organization that is subordinate to the Russian intelligence agency, I give more than a couple of weeks to think about it. This operation, as I've said in my books, most likely started right after the election of Barack Obama for his second term. Mm. A guy by the name of Konstantin Rykov, the owner of Channel One in Russia, actually wrote a Facebook post about it where he said that night he and Donald Trump were DMing each other. And Trump said, we should be marching on Washington. How can we allow this guy, Barack Obama, you know, worst president in history, to win and beat Mitt Romney. And Rikoff said to him, if you want Donald, if you want, if you want to run for president, I will support you. Donald Trump tweeted or DM'd him, him giving the double thumbs up. Mm -hmm. One week later, he registered Make America Great Again PAC. 
That's November of 2012. So the Internet Research Agency starts up 12, uh, 10 months later. Two months after that, the Miss Universe pageant happens. And we know Trump Tower Moscow is being discussed in there, right? Donald Trump is already talking about giving Vladimir Putin a $50 million bribe in the form of a penthouse on top of it. Then Russia invades Crimea in spring of 2014. Donald Trump will not criticize him, but criticizes Barack Obama. Then in 2014, the, F, the Mueller report identifies the Internet Research Agency starts full-scale operations. The election's not even for two years. This is called strategic framing. The Russians were aware that whatever happened in 2012, they were going to have something to say about it in 2016. But we've also seen that they started talking, they started co-opting the National Rifle Association in 2010 by sending Maria Butina and Alexander Torshin to the United States with their Rights to Bear Arm Group, 2010 to 2012, then Evangelicals in 2010. Russia had a strategic plan, and this report spells out in horrific detail how they move from strategic framing, use the Internet Research Agency to call, do what we call meta-narrative framing. That's where you build an information bubble around your opponents. In the information bubble they started with in 2013, I'm sorry, 2014 was Russia good, Hillary bad, Donald Trump good. That's it. All of their reports, and I believe that in this report they said Facebook had 740 accounts that put out over 80,000 posts that reached 126 million Americans. Twitter had some insane number, like 7,000 accounts that put out 1.5 million tweets that all framed those three things. Russia good, Hillary bad, Donald Trump, President of the United States. This was a multi-year effort. Before we ever get into when they start flooding the zone with humans, right? Kislyak, the diplomat, to give prime cover to all of these people. He would be first point of contact. He would go and they would meet guys like Michael Flynn, bring him to Russia, give him a, a, a speech where he earns forty or $50,000, sit him next to Vladimir Putin, right? Former director of Defense Intelligence Agency. Jill Stein is on the other end of that table, right? All of this occurred in 2015. Donald Trump hadn't even announced mm -hmm. that he was running for president. Trump Tower Moscow is going into full steam. Every aspect of the American experience with this election on one side of the ledger had the word Russia attached to it. I was recently called by someone, conservative, a conspiracy theorist. Recently? Yeah, and it's funny how that works, right? Um, a conspiracy theorist is someone who works in no facts or takes those facts and molds them. And as I said, I go, well, I have one reference now to all of my books, okay? I got 440 pages of reference. By the way, my last book, Plot to Destroy Democracy, 600 references. Because mm -hmm. in my world, like the chalkboard, I have to show my work. Facts matter. Okay, I don't make these <laughs> things up. What you saw with your own eyes exists. Mm -hmm. Just because Bill Barr jumped up and said, no collusion, no obstruction, there's this report here, and it says there's a lot of, there is a lot of activities which, one last point, they found that there were 77 people lied to the FBI, or 77 instances of lying, where they did not want to talk about what would most likely have shown collusion. Good example, uh, George Papadopoulos. They said for all of the two months that he was working back and forth, with a guy who was suspected of being an asset of Russian government and a mysterious woman who was claimed to be Vladimir Putin's niece, going back trying to arrange a summit with uh, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, trying to get dirt on Hillary Clinton back to Donald Trump, 
they concluded there was no collusion or conspiracy because they could not identify if he had turned or briefed anyone on the campaign. That one thing. The problem is, it also says in the next sentence that people destroyed evidence, people lied to the special counsel, and information could not be found because people were deliberately obstructing them. And there's a sentence here, I think it's at the end of page one or two, there it is. Uh, no, that's not the one. But what it says is that because so many people lied, destroyed information, put things on encrypted apps and then deleted them, that this information could not be validated or verified. So yeah, he could have conspired. Now in my crazy world, where there's a little gap in information, we call these black holes. And black holes don't materialize out of nowhere. Black holes tend to have a gravity well that pulls one set of information and another set of information towards it. And if there's a gap in information, I will make the little leap. And if you say, he went through all of this effort for months and months to get dirt on Hillary Clinton and didn't tell anybody. How many of you believe that? Why would multiple, I refer to them in my next book as dirty tricks teams. Mm -hmm. They were identified six separate dirty tricks teams. Michael Flynn, uh, uh, the Trump Tower, and Michael Cohen trying to do a peace, tree, a peace uh, plan for the Ukraine that would essentially give half of the Ukraine to Russia. Uh, trying to lift sanctions. Each one of these teams was looking for dirt on Hillary Clinton, and it all had a nexus in Russia, and it's all in this book. So let me do this before we open it up, because I do want to yeah. spend more time than we usually do opening it up for questions. So if we need to set up mics, why don't we do that? Yeah, because we want to answer your question. But having said all of that, what should voters do to avoid election tampering in 2020? I mean, is absentee voting the way to go? Uh, obviously, our government is not interested in protecting us from cyber attacks or things like that, and it certainly this speaks to it, what would your advice be to people for 2020 when That's, they go to vote? It's a good question. I mean, and, and you should all be asking yourselves, Malcolm, we've, we've come this far. We've got a president that calls everything in here a hoax. Everything. We have a nation that was attacked. We have a system that is under threat. We have a president who also, you know, dismantled the cybersecurity groups that would protect us yeah. from these who, as they said in this report, was aware that they would benefit from the Russian effort, mm -hmm. right? He's not going to do anything, right? He won with this. If he's lucky, they'll do it again. Mm -hmm. So how do we protect ourselves? Well, the first thing is the very fact that you're here, and this is being live streamed, sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. Mm -hmm. You, as an informed citizenry, are the most critical part of this. You have to talk to people. As you all know, one-third of this nation won't believe a word we've said here today. One-third of the nation will not believe a word in this report. One-third of 320 million people will call you a liar to your face. But you have to take advantage of what you've learned. You have to actually go out and help. You have to write to your congressman and your citizen. But most importantly, you have to vote like American democracy is about to end, because it might. That's a pretty easy answer. So we're, we're setting this up, and I'm going I'm to ask you one more question. Sure. You know, the DOJ policy, and it's arguable, depending on which attorneys you talk to, that a sitting president can't be indicted. Right. Obviously, the direct conflict of interest is DOJ sits under the executive branch. Let me just ask you, do you think it were not for that policy, would Mueller have actually gone the extra mile and recommended charges against the president? Yes. Okay. Because it's in the report. He wrote that. He wrote it in the report. It, it's, in summary, it says, were it not for this Department of Justice guideline, mm -hmm. right, this would have, their further action would have been taken. It's a guideline. It's not a law. It's not enshrined in the Constitution. It is not a law. Someone thunk it up. I, I, you know, I, I think um, uh, they, had a, they had the person who had written that law in 1972, or the guidelines mm -hmm. in 1972. And then since then, Neil Katyal, 
uh, for, you know, modified that. And they were like, whoa, whoa, this does not give the president, I think the last line, it does not give the president of the United States immunity. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm in the refs, but I believe that's one of the last lines, that the president of the United States and no man is above the law, okay. including the president of the United States. So yeah, that guideline needs to be, I don't know if it needs to be looked at or thrown out, but whatever's happened here, there are people who think that it is permission to murder, right. and that you can literally walk away from it because you're president of the United States. So let me go to Carol. Well, are you, is there a mic up there? Or the mic's oh, down mic's here. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm no, sorry. you just. Okay. Uh, Who has questions? There's a hand there. First things first. Hello. Hello. How are you? Just the first thing. Do you think that uh, Barr stopped the investigation at all? Deterred hmm. uh, Mueller from, you know. That's a good question. Do, do I think Barr stopped the investigation? We don't have any evidence of that. But Bill Barr apparently had another job, which was, and it appears that he's a troubleshooter at this, that he's done this at least twice before, once with Iran-Contra and once with the George W. Bush administration in relation to uh, weapons of mass destruction, I mm -hmm. think, uh, this, the, 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 Jung, the Sioux report, or the U report in torture. Mm -hmm. And he came in as a distinguished lawyer looked at it, showed everyone that he had the gravitas and the experience of a person who has served in government, and then he killed those investigations dead. Donald Trump, it is said that Donald Trump has always wanted his own Roy Cohen, right? Mm. His own hitman lawyer, his consigliere, you know, uh, the, 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 the Tom from, you know, the Godfather, <laughs> you know, his own lawyer to come out and do his bidding. And I'm afraid to say, and this is not a conspiracy theory. We all see it now. And believe me, I was hammered the day after the first bar memo mm -hmm. with people saying you lied, everything you wrote's a lie. You know, we all saw it with our own eyes. This guy came and he took all the information and he made his own determination. I don't know about you, but this took me days to read and study. Days, maybe a good week. Mm -hmm to read and study both sections of the book, full time, on the airplane, left and right, falling asleep with it in my lap, <laughs> and somehow he took this and came up with an opinion in less than 48 hours that said no collusion, no obstruction, even though it is chock full of obstruction. Sure and the collusion, I don't like to use the word collusion, but the conspiracy in here, he clearly states that the information could change if they get m additional information that shows that final bridge from one person to the next. But we know people who lied about it. George Papadopoulos, con confronted by the FBI about this after being taken off an airplane, lied to the federal agents, arrested, went to jail for two weeks. Now he says the whole thing's a conspiracy theory. These people are relatively loyal to this timeline, to this information line. And I think they're willing to stick to it. Okay. So next question. Next. Um, since the Russian, oh, there you are. Um, if, if we are weighing the, the, the wealth of a country with the weapon they have, uh, California has uh, got more money than the Russian. Yeah. So would that be the way the Russians attack the U.S. by the disinformation? Mm -hmm. What kind of threat? I mean, how, how can you uh, weigh those threats? Yeah. It's a good question, Wolf. If the Russians are so good at disinformation, you know, how do we confront these threats, right? How, how do we, what can we do about it? Is that the fundamental of your question? Yeah. You have to understand something about it. And this is why when I talk, I always go back to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. The first time Russia tried a disinformation operation against the United States was 1917. The, the, communist, you know, the communist regime tried that. Here's one that I'm sure all of you have heard, right? In the 1980s, when the AIDS epidemic was, had broken out, the Russians, and we've actually interviewed, there's a, there's a book from the guy that came up with this story, came up with it in a conference of how can we screw the United States. 
The AIDS epidemic, when it broke out in the United States, was generally affecting gay men and Haitians, right? The Russians, using surrogates, passing this information around news media in the third world, got the story started that it was actually a CIA biological weapons program and that they were deliberately infecting the black community and the gay community with AIDS. If you don't believe that, type in AIDS, CIA, Haitians, and you will see probably a dozen websites that still push that report. The man, I've spoken to the guy that came up with that. It's persistent, and our enemy uses these disinformation memes, these themes, these frameworks to not just come at us because they want to get money or they want to lift sanctions. The fundamental is to damage us as a democracy. If you want to make Russia great again, you've got to tear America down, right? And you've got to, you know, you use MAGA, right, to MAGA, you know, and that's what you do. You make, look, you, you, right now we have a country that is split. One third of this nation, 40%, will flat out refuse to believe what they see with their own eyes, mm -hmm. what they can actually quantifiably count with their own fingers. They refuse to believe it. And now what you have to do is you can't deprogram all of them. The only way you can deprogram is to overwhelm them with the truth. And what we're seeing now with the President of the United States, he is now making truth debatable. Debatable. You have to stick to what you know is a fact. Don't go into conspiracy theories. Go into hard evidence. We have people, you know, when President, this came out, President Trump hailed it. Robert Mueller, great guy. Right? Now, just yesterday, he called it a hoax and a disgrace and a dis disgusting Mueller report. He wants, he does that deliberately. Mm -hmm. Right? This is a man who studied Herman Goebbels. I mean, you know, uh, not Herman Goering, Her Her studied Goebbels, the propagandist of Nazi Germany. Right? Joseph Goebbels. Thank you. Three times you tell a lie. You repeat it three times and you keep repeating it. This is a man who Ivana Trump said would read him Mein Kampf to her in bed. He loved how Hitler gave speeches. I'm not saying, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that he has anything to do with Nazi Germany. That's a completely different discussion that we can talk about later. Because <laughs> we all know the answer to that one. But he uses tropes that have been successful in history for meta-narrative framing, where he builds information frames around a bubble of people who will never come out of that bubble. David Koresh did that with the Branch Davidians. Jim Jones did that in, in Guyana when he convinced people they were going to be attacked and they all needed to go to heaven right now. Om Shinrikyo Oso, did that in Sakahara. Japan. Yeah, Osho, Osho Sakahara. Sakahara. Mm -hmm. I mean, information is the greatest disinfectant. And the fact that you're here to get it from me and the people who are watching on live stream, which means you want more information, go get it. Take this and quote it. Please read it. We've, let's take one more over on this side. Sorry. Peter? I'll be around for a little bit. So. This one's for both of you. Could you give us some perspective on the status of the counterintelligence investigation and what that involves? I think that's kind of the elephant in the room. Well, yeah. That's a good one. It's a good question. Because guess what's not in this report? The CIA. Yeah, the CIA by hunting. That's right. So the one thing I, I can at least speak to is one of the things that Director McCabe did before he was fired is he put in place the system and the agents and the investigation that it can never go away. So regardless of what you may hear from DC, regardless of what you may hear from the White House, that investigation continues. I work for foreign counterintelligence. Um, I'll just say this, that it's one of those things that, as you notice, the FBI has become increasingly more vilified over the last two years. They understand the FBI was established and the directorship was established so it would not be beholden to the President of the United States. It is the reason that the FBI director has a 10-year term, so he or she overlaps at least two administrations. Comey's firing was only the second one in history. There's a reason for that. So these investigations continue. It's alluded to in the Mueller report repeatedly, and trust me, um, they will continue. They will see the light of day. 
maybe later rather than sooner, but they're ongoing right now. Um, I'm not a counterintelligence guy. Uh, I'm an intelligence guy. But I know what they do because they protect me. I've been in, I've been in situations where I've, I literally had counterintelligence teams come around me on mission to make sure that the people who thought they were going to come and kill me didn't kill me, right? You're welcome. They scrubbed my back. <laughs> Wasn't bureau, guys. <laughs> but that's what they do. I just want to call attention to a component of the counterintelligence mission and the way Donald Trump went after the FBI. And it makes me very suspicious. Every person that he went after, uh, Lisa Page, uh, what's his name, Peter Strzok. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Strzok was the head of the counterintelligence division of the FBI. He was the chief of the spy hunters. Now, if you have something to hide, and it involves a foreign power, which maybe you're not dealing with them, maybe you're not calling them up and signing a contract, but you know they're working in your interest, especially when you get on the stage and say, Russia, if you're listening, I need you to find Hillary Clinton's 30,000 emails. And five hours later, according to this document, they start tasking Russian military intelligence teams to start hacking Hillary Clinton's server, which, by the way, was never, ever gotten into. Remember that secure server that they said was unsecure? Pretty secure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they did the next best thing. They went to her friends. And by the way, if they're going to get into your email, it's your friends who's going to give you up. Right? They're going to read your emails that you're, you responded to on someone else's email. So how did they do this? The Trump team immediately started attacking the very foundation of counterintelligence. Now, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you say, hey, I need my tail cleared. I'm going to let the FBI do that. Because there's another story that is also not in the Mueller report. And that's the story that uh, I know Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell have been saying they want to investigate. No one, and at no time in this investigation, did the FBI determine whether Donald Trump was compromised in some way by a foreign power. It's not in here. Not at all. All it talks about is Russia flooding the zone, the people on the Trump team that were in contact with the Russians, and there was a lot of contact, right? And how there was no criminal conspiracy that could be found that would meet beyond, a bene a beyond reasonable doubt. Which means that if they had taken this into a courtroom, they needed beyond reasonable doubt to get a conviction. So therefore, they decided if they couldn't get that, no collusion, right? For the rest of us, we'd all be in jail. Mm -hmm. So Rep. Malcolm's going to be here. But before I thank him and thank you, I want to close Perfect. with this. And I want to thank my dean for being here today. One thing that you do learn, you don't have to be an FBI agent. You know that when the dean says, I read this really good book, you need to take, make sure you read it. Um, and he read How Democracies Die, and I highly recommend it. I just want to read one passage from it as we close here today. To save our democracy, Americans need to restore the basic norms that once protected it. But we must do more than that. We must extend those norms through the whole of a diverse society. We must make them truly inclusive. America's democratic norms, at their core, have always been sound. But for much of our history, they were accompanied, indeed, sustained by racial exclusion. Now those norms must be made to work in an age of racial equality and unprecedented ethnic diversity. Few societies in history have managed to be both multiracial and genuinely democratic. This is our challenge. It is also our opportunity. If we meet it, America will be truly exceptional. So I'm just going to end with, before I thank Malcolm, with my Winston Churchill quote, which is my favorite. You know, this is not the end. It's not the beginning of the end, but it certainly is the end of the beginning. Malcolm, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for your service. And thank you for being here.